Okay. Okay. Um, eh, bienvenidos. Welcome to today's talk with Peter Carlo Becerra from the University of Puerto Rico um, at Rio Piedras. I am Larry Lafontaine. I am the director of the Latino Studies Program, which is a constitutive unit of the Department of American Culture. We are one of the four ethnic studies units located in this department together with Arab American, Asian Pacific Islander American, and Native American Studies. So we're really delighted that you're all here for this event. We recently concluded Latino Heritage Month. It, was, it has been an ins insanely busy time of year with a number of events. So, <coughs> so I know some of you I've seen at some of our other events, so thank you so much, and thank you for joining us today. The Latino Studies Program um, was established in 1984 um, through student and faculty and staff activism. So we are celebrating our 30th anniversary. It has always been part of the Department of American Culture. We offer a number of classes each semester, which are listed now on the LSNA course guide under the title Latino American Studies. So that's an innovation in terms of being able to access the names of the courses that we teach. We offer an uh, undergraduate minor, a major, and a graduate certificate through Rackham that is open to Rackham students across the university and that requires 12 credits or 9 credits plus an experiential activity. As you can tell, I am the advisor for Latino Studies, uh, so if you have any questions about our courses, our minor, our major, or our grad certificate, I am quite happy to talk to you. We also have a brochure in the back, and we have a very, very informative website, including a weekly newsletter put together by Hannah Young, who is in the back taking photos. Um, so if you're not receiving our weekly newsletter, you can sign up for that by clicking a box on the webpage, or you can contact me or Hannah. Uh, we also run several email groups, Latino Studies Grads, LS Community, um, Latino Studies Majors, Minors. So if you're interested in receiving our messages and learning about the Latino Studies issues around campus, um, please let us know. I'm very glad that we have uh, Lenny Ureña from Latin American and Caribbean Studies, uh, our partner unit at the International Institute. So if you're interested in Latin American studies or uh, events on campus, she is a wonderful resource, as is the former director, Professor Jesse Hoffman Garskoff, who's sitting in the back and is also a faculty member in Latino studies. So it's a real delight to have Peter here. Uh, Peter currently works in the Department of Anthropology and Sociology at the UPR Rio Piedras. He um, defended or completed his dissertation two years ago. Um, if I am not correct, it has the same title, which is White and Which Color Notes on Race and or Color Among Puerto Ricans in Interwar New York City. He completed this dissertation at Binghamton University, State University of New York, under the directorship uh, of Kelvin Santiago Valles, a renowned Puerto Rican sociologist, also working with other people such as Dale Tomich. Um, Peter uh, also studied with Terence Hopkins. Um, he is a Bronx born and raised New Yorican who has resided in the Puerto Rican archipelago for well over a decade, along with his two children. He's also a graduate of Lehman College CUNY and the public high schools of New York City. His ruminations on the entangled character of race and or color, space, labor, crime, and politics in historic New York are not just academic fare, they are constructs of the conceptual evidence of his experiences. He is also fond of designing and teaching courses in sociological method. And before I le paso la palabra, before I let him take over, I also just want to thank the generous co-sponsorship of American Culture, Latin American Caribbean Studies, the National Center for Institutional Diversity, the Department of Sociology, and the Department of Afro-American and African Studies. So please join me in welcoming Peter Carlo Becerra. Thank you. 
kind of strange for me to be here. I didn't anticipate being out west, Midwest. What, what is this technically? It's Midwest. The border, right? It's just before Central Time, right? Um, so I, I really didn't think this would be happening to me in the space of uh, this semester, this year. <coughs> Larry uh, happened upon my dissertation, some duties that he had, he was attending to. And uh, uh, he thought it'd be good that I share some of his content with people here at Umich and Harvard. It's really, you know, something for me to be here. I, I, I've known people from Ann Arbor, uh, you know, and I've respected their work, and so it's like, it's really something to be here for. Uh, it really is. Um, and it, of course, it's going to be something for me to be able to share this with you and get your feedback because, uh, you know, um, I really need to know whether or not this stuff works. <laughs> you know, whether or not it flies. So. Um, <clears throat> What I'm, what I'm planning to do today is, I'm planning to give a, this is more than suggested by Larry, by the way, but, um, and it just makes sense though, right? I'll give kind of a brief overview on the dissertation. I'll try to be as brief as possible, uh, try to control myself. Um, and then I'd like to read an excerpt that I've been abbreviating in the wee hours since yesterday. <laughs> it's knocking stuff off so I can make it uh, manageable so we can use it in the space of 20 minutes. So, I'm going to go, I'm going to give a, a part overview on the dissertation. I'll do about 20 minutes there, then uh, I'm going to read an excerpt, right? Um, this is the uh, flyer that was put together by Hannah uh, from Theo Studies. Uh, it's amazing, actually. It's a really nice one. I never could have kind of, this idea wouldn't have occurred to me, actually, before <laughs> to repeat my dissertation. Um, you can see the title, um, which is white and which colored. Notes on race and color among Puerto Ricans in the 2020 world. It's precisely what it is. I tried to scale down the ambitions of my representation, but really, uh, you know, when I first started on the thing, it was this broad, long historical treatment of, of Puerto Ricans, African Americans, and Southern Italians. And then mm -hmm. when it got right down to it, all I had really was that took some stuff that could really justify was a discussion about Puerto Ricans, and race, and color during that period. And I had some stuff there that I thought was original. Uh, um, and so I said, okay, I'm going to scale this down. This is Grayson Colorado, Puerto Rico, in New York City. And the title is taken from uh, J. A. Rogers. Uh, I don't know how many people are familiar with J. A. Rogers. J. A. Rogers is uh, a uh, prominent uh, writer during the Harlem Renaissance, Jamaican. Uh, 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 and during this time, he publishes a, a, a number of uh, texts that are still read. If you walk through Harlem today, you'll see some of his titles sold on, in the, by the street vendors. Uh, one of them is Sex and Race, three volumes of study on sex and designation. It's a really long historical thing, going back to antiquity. He has his documented with photos. It's a great thing. And what is he doing? Basically, I think in some ways he's kind of projecting, uh, because J.A. Rogers was somebody who had family who passed away, um, and they did pass away as Jamaicans. And uh, he, I don't know if he could, I mean, look at his pictures, I think in some, Circumstances, he could probably passed away. Some people suggested about Arturo Schomburg. Some people said Arturo Schomburg could live. I, I think it was McKay who said that Schomburg could pass, live in the fringes of the of the white world, right? Well, maybe McKay could have too. I mean, I'm sorry, um, Rogers. But so but Rogers is really kind of treating this uh, this theme of of, of racial integration, right? Designation is the term, right? And so he has this chapter on Latin America, and he has this one chapter on Puerto Ricans, and the chapter on Latin America is not divorced from Harlem because it's about Puerto Ricans, and Puerto Ricans in New York at the time he's writing the thing, right? And so this is a quote taken from um, um, a, a, the piece. Uh, it, it's a photograph of, of a woman who uh, was brought to trial um, for supposedly having a white child, right? And so it's a Puerto Rican woman. And so he, has, he says, three Puerto Ricans in New York, uh, she, she, she adopted one, right? One of them is her biological, the other one is not, right? So he asked the question, three, three Puerto Ricans in New York, two colored and one white, right? Suit was brought to take the white child from the adopted mother on the ground that Negroes ought not to rear white children, which is white and which is colored. So he asked this question, and at a certain point, he uses the term, the phrase, Tweedledee and Tweedledum, to describe the children. And what does he mean by that precisely? He's kind of alluding to the fact that it's kind of hard to discern which one of these children is the biological child of the mother, right? And you might, you might come to some like pan determination which one is called. But remember, one of them is biological, one is adopted. So can you tell which one is biological? If that child is biological, then is that not the equal child? 
<laughs> right? Get the point? So he plays off of this uh, um, 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 ambiguity to talk more broadly about Puerto Ricans and, and the way he talks about Puerto Ricans, Dominicans, many Caribbeans. Uh, but it's interesting that he's, he's dealing with Puerto Ricans precisely at the time when they arrived in New York with their first mass migration in, in considerable numbers. They reached 40,000 by 1930 19, uh, in New York City. Um, they arrived in New York during that time. And so, um, so talking about race and color, uh, it, it, among Puerto Ricans is not divorced. I'm talking about race and color among Puerto Ricans in Harlem, where J.A. Rogers is living and where he's a part of the Harlem uh, Renaissance, right? And so, um, what, does that, what does this have to do with my work? Well, this race and color uh, indistinguishability, this ambiguity that Rogers is kind of pointing to, uh, uh, interestingly enough, I didn't expect to find it confirmed or represented to such a degree in, in the sources that deal with Puerto Ricans in the period, but I did. It just it, I happened upon it, right? And so, I mean, first off, um, my initial impression was that when I looked at race and color among Puerto Ricans, I would find a white majority, and that was the case, <laughs> right? Very consistent with the, the, the federal census uh, representations and the censuses in Puerto Rico from the 1840s on, when the white, first white majority appeared. Um, Puerto Ricans in New York, uh, uh, in the, the, the occasion of the 1925 manuscript census, are majority uh, of white. Uh, I kind of inverted the colors here, so you have to excuse me. I'm sorry. You know, the white Puerto, the white dots are black Puerto Ricans. <laughs> sorry, I, I don't know why I did that. But anyway, so the, this, this, the, these black clusters are actually white Puerto Ricans, right? So you see the white majority represented. Eight out of every ten, more or less seven, seven, seven out of every ten or eight out of every ten, with some difference depending on the descending year, right? Um, from uh, uh, 1899 to 1940 in the census, right? And so. I, I take the census, I look at the census, the state census of 1925, which is the last year the state census was done. Um, and I do it because I wanted, I, my, I wanted to study race and color among Puerto Ricans. I wanted to identify where they were. I wanted to look at, at kind of identify the relationship between their race and color and where they lived, right? Their residential distribution, um, uh, the, the jobs that they worked, right? Um, and um, the, their susceptibility to arrest. This was, this was I mean, you know, I, I studied in Calvin Santiago Valle, so he studies criminalization of race, I want to study criminalization of race, right? And so, um, so, I, so I looked at the state census and I came up with the white majority. But then, I looked at the people who were arrested and I had a black majority. Living in the same places where these Puerto Ricans reside in the same pockets. In this part of Brooklyn, uh, this is uh, 1925 and 1928. And so, Whereas the, okay, so the, 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 the proportions of white to black classified Puerto Ricans were 8 to 10 in the state census, in all the census, 7 to 10, 8 to 10. On, on the occasion of their arrest in 1925 in particular, the proportions of people are 8 to 10 black to white, the invert, inverted, 8 to 10 black, right? Black classified, right? So this was, this really hit me, right? And one of the reasons why it hit me was because of the distribution. There were black Puerto Ricans arrested in places where there were only white Puerto Ricans. <laughs> Right, that was actually, if you, if I, I do a more uh, specific analysis of this on the level of city blocks. And so when you look at city blocks, it's absolutely the case that more often than not, when you did find uh, Puerto Ricans who were arrested, who were classified as black on particular city blocks, or Puerto Ricans who found the census in 1925, most of those people on those blocks were, were classified as white. And, and so, so, okay, so that's just to give you an idea, right? So this leads me in the course of my, uh, 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 the citation suggests that you know Puerto Ricans might have been black, white by enumeration, but they were black on the streets, right? And so um, I, I, I start off the, uh, the the introduction to the to, I don't know if you, you distributed the introduction to the uh, so if you did, okay, I thought it might be relevant. I, I I kind of wrote something about the piece that that I thought would be distributed to the campus community, but it's okay. Don't worry about it. Well, there's a there's a paragraph description. Yeah, yeah, sure. Don't worry about it. Don't worry about that. So in, in the paragraph description that I provide, I talk, I start off with cognitive distance, cognitive distance. Fanon uses the term at one point, right? I don't know if you remember. It's I, he he talks about you know how this 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 disconnect disconnect between you know predominant re representations and uh, uh, that Antillians were experiencing when they migrated to France, right? That the the the, 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 the uh, uh, characterizations of them as black, where when when in, when in, in Martinique and Guadeloupe they thought of themselves as not black, they thought of other people as black, <laughs> right? And so. And so um, this kind of distance was, was it apparent to me to some degree among Puerto Ricans, right? Um, and this is why I say black on the streets. And, and, and so here you have the dissonance, right? The Jews confused us 
for people of color, hence the color, right? Um, when I first came to the country, the Italians to them, to the Jews, they were Negroes, the Puerto Ricans. So here's kind of, you know, the, the indication that these people didn't consider themselves as people of African descent or black. So it was, they couldn't explain this uh, experience that we're having. And this was kind of a generalized pattern, right? And uh, so um, here we have the dissonance on the, on the level of people who were interviewed. I'm talking about second generations, people were interviewed in the 1970s. They were already like in their 70s and 80s. They were talking about what happened to them during the interwar years. And you know, on balance, you have like these very strange kind of uh, explanations. Like, okay, we were discriminated against. I don't know why. I don't know why they discriminated against us because we were small, you know, <laughs> or uh, you know, because we we spoke Spanish, you know. But then the same guy who said it's because we spoke Spanish, he got beat up because he walked into a pool room. They could somatically identify him. So you know, so this this kind of dissonance was very generalized, and so. This is this dissonance to me is also it's it's, it's here, it's here on, on the on the broader representation of the right? and so um, and I, I try to explain this in part by uh, taking a cue from who goes from here, right? Who came from Bruno? This is one of the reasons why I left. I know he so got much. his PhD. Exactly, you know, Bruno uh, 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 writes his book about uh, the Negro Leagues and, and and Caribbean Latinos in the Negro Leagues. You guys, I know you guys have read some of his pieces, right? And so, um, you know, basically he's arguing there that you had shared after that export, you had a shared inheritance in spaces, right? They just shared after that export spaces that uh, uh, Puerto Ricans and Antillian ball players uh, uh, experienced uh, because they played in the East, because they lived in Harlem, because they, when they went to the South, they were subject to segregation because um, when the, 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 the Negro League games were over um, in the States, they, 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 their friends in, 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 uh, in the Caribbean got them. Uh, jobs playing ball in the Caribbean. So, the, and so and we're talking about a, 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 a relationship over decades. It's kind of shared after direct sport or characters and spaces you see, you know, in other instances, you know, with, with music. You know, Rafael Hernandez, uh, the principal uh, composer of Puerto Rican music of the 20th century, uh, got his start in the United States playing for the James Europe Band. The James Europe Band was the uh, band that played for the, uh, the, I think it was the 44th, the Harlem 44th during uh, World War One. He went down to Puerto, to Puerto Rico to recruit people who, who, could, who could read, and he composed Rafael Hernandez and another person, I'm forgetting his name, another important composer, Puerto Rican composer, and these people became the premier uh, uh, composers of music, in uh, Puerto Rican music, in, in the early 20th century, like mid to late 20th, mid, early to mid 20th century, right? And so, so I, I kind of, my, my sense from this is that when you explain Puerto Ricans and the, 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 the racial situation of Puerto Ricans, the, the racialization of Puerto Ricans, um, I, I, I take a cue from Burgo, right? That you know, some people, they're, they're, they're throwing around a lot, of, there's a, it's, it's being thrown, it's being bantered around a lot, the discussion, right? Neither black or white is one of the principal theses that are being bantered around. I, I like Burgo's explanation better. Pigeonholed in a state between black and something else, mm -hmm. right? Which is, there's a direct relationship to uh, uh, the people who were, who were part of the shared spaces and the people who uh, were assumed to be an extension of the African diaspora, even if they didn't want to, right? And so um, that leads me, you know, to, to look concretely at these expressions. He was, you know, uh, uh, this is uh, Central Park, um, uh, this is Southern Harlem. Um, yeah, anybody who's seen these maps knows the urban or the urban league map. This is where most Puerto Ricans were concentrated circa 1985, <coughs> right? Um, uh, Lawrence Chenault says uh, the, the principal concentration was um, on 116th um, and um, 116th and next, right? And so that densest concentration was precisely in a space where uh, um, other uh, people from the African diaspora had extended south to uh, consolidate the area for black people. This is what McKay says. McKay says that Puerto Ricans played a role in consolidating a Harlem for black people. He, gives the, he says, well, you know, if, if, if anybody knows anything about Harlem, Harlem was consolidated for black people proper, for you know, uh, uh, African Americans uh, 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 and African Caribbeans, uh, other African Caribbeans, then you know that uh, uh, what happened was that uh, um, uh, uh, Philip Payton uh, sent people to a, a people who could pass to buy properties and rent properties. And then after the, after the passing folks got in, they, the uh, other people could not pass game, right? And this uh, created a white flight, which eventually uh, led to the formation of Harlem. He says the same thing about Puerto Ricans more or less. He says the Puerto Ricans, the darker Puerto Ricans, would, would not be the ones who would uh, be allowed to white neighborhoods. The, the whiter ones would, would arrive, and the darker ones would follow tail. And so you have this uh, a, a, a meeting of the two uh, uh, um, non-white uh, African diasporic uh, populations right here, uh, coming north from 125th and south 
from um, uh, Yorkville and what's in the bio today, right? Um, and so, and you saw this, this is also the case in Beachhead. Here's the Beachhead again. This is the place where Puerto Ricans live in Brooklyn. It's called Beachhead. This place in particular was the only place where Puerto Ricans class were, were uh, a sound, Puerto Ricans classified as black, were a sound majority in relationship to uh, Puerto Ricans who were uh, white. It, it looks like a very statistically small number, but it's not statistically small considering it was the only space where this happened. And in, 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 there were all these, are, these, these, these divided select election districts. This was the only place we had a election district where most of the Puerto Ricans were classified as black. The only place. And that was because African Americans and other African Caribbeans lived there. <laughs> right? So here's the other crossroads, right? Uh, uh, similar to, um, to Harlem, the Harlem crossroads, right? The Harlem the crossroads in, in downtown Brooklyn. Right? And so you can see the dispersal. Puerto Ricans were, even the black Puerto Ricans, only exceptionally concentrated near African Americans, even the black Puerto Ricans. The black classified Puerto Ricans. Only exceptionally. Only here. Uh, uh, was, was the reason for the, the presence of the black Puerto Rican majority uh, uh, evident, evidently related to the fact that this was a this was a black space in Brooklyn, one of the few spaces where, in the census tracts, blacks constitute a majority, black and hard. Right? What, what is red? Oh, red Italians. <laughs> red Italians, blue are um, English-speaking Caribbean. Yeah. And yellow is African American. Yellow is African American, right. Okay. Next to that. <laughs> Now, these, these maps are horrible. I'm, I'm sorry for the condition of these maps, but I'm, I'm using them just, just again, to, uh, th th again to elaborate on a broader scale McKay's thesis about Puerto Ricans in Harlem. This was happening uh, 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 historically with Puerto Ricans up in New York. And so here you have, this is uh, 1910, uh, the extension of census tracts that were classified as black. Here's uh, the beachhead, right, with, without Puerto Ricans still. Right, this area here. Um, there's um, Harlem, south of Harlem, right in front of Central Park, there's hardly any. Uh, of black people there, right? Let's go further. 1920, you have a little more folks there. Extending a little further down, not too much, not too much until the 1920. In the beachhead though, I'm sorry, you really can't see this one, I'm sorry. You have, you have more census tracts where there are people of, uh, 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 people, of black people uh, classified, right? And those are precisely the spaces where Puerto Ricans uh, migrate to between 1920 and 1930. And, and then it's much more consolidated by 1930. You see this whole mm -hmm. st extension here, plus this area, these are primarily Puerto Rican spaces. Right. Uh -huh. I was just curious: are, are the dark spaces of those majority black districts, or are they just? just I, 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 I forget. I don't want to say. I, I, I have a feeling it, it, there might be plurality. It might be plurality. Yeah. It might be plurality. Yeah. I, I'm not sure. I'm. A, I doubt. Actually, I doubt it's 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 majority. It's plurality. It's probably plurality because you know it, it would be inconsistent if it was, this was all majority. This was all majority being consistent. Yeah. Right. Uh, so um. Anyway, and so you know the the obvious. Uh, how someone knows about this, right? <laughs> you know, here's Arturo uh, Schomburg um, uh, living in that extension, that shared African American sports space. But in Brooklyn, I'm sorry, I'm sorry about the ground. I'm really sorry. I don't know why I put this up. This is, he Schomburg is here. He's here somewhere. <laughs> He's there with his family since 1925. He's in Bedford Park, Brooklyn. I'll, I'll get you a clearer graphic. Okay. <laughs> he was counted as black that year. Oh yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely. Unlike most other Puerto Ricans. And so. Um, Okay, so, and the other thing I do here is another instance of the Sheriff of the Dark Sports Space Manifestations I talk about um, uh, numbers. The numbers game. Numbers was very big in Harlem. It was, uh, um, it was called policy, right? And um, a, a, it was a, an experience of the golden age, according to McKinney, during the 1920s, right? It was remaking, a lot of money was making. There were black millionaires uh, um, a, being made from policy, and they were incredible philanthropists, people like Casper Holstein, um, Alexander Pompez. Uh, these were central people in the lifeline of the African American community, the African Caribbean community, English speaking Af African Caribbean community. It was also the case with Puerto Ricans. <laughs> now, Puerto Ricans, the Politeros, <coughs> they were called Politeros, and interesting enough, if you read, um, David W. Lewis's uh, take on, um, on um, the, um, the Harlem Renaissance. He has, he has a, a, I'm sorry, he cites Carl Van Vechten, Carl Van Vechten's fictionalized treatment of Harlem, where he has a figure that's the stand-in for Casper Holstein, Holstein, who is the, the numbers man, the premier policy man in Harlem, uh, and he's called the Bolitos King. You know, so Bolitos King, Bolitos, it's, 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 it's spelled wrong, it's Bolitas, mm -hmm. right? So Van Vechten had it wrong, but he had it right uh, in terms of uh, naming, giving this uh, name uh, to a, a Harlem policy king, not calling him a policy king, calling him a, a Bolitos king, a Bolitas king, because the, according to McKay, the origins of the game, in its new form, not its historic form, its historic form was already soundly African-American uh, African form in those spaces, in its new form, it's most, mostly 
uh, it was brought to Harlem by uh, African Caribbeans, <coughs> English-speaking African Caribbeans, and Puerto Ricans and Cubans. <laughs> mm -hmm. And it comes out of an uh, um, uh, innovation in the game in, um, East, in East, East Harlem by a Spaniard named Catalan. He develops a new system that's dependable, and he says, that this, this system, we need, to, we need to play the game because they, they're, they're not going to take advantage of us if we play this lottery. And so the, it, takes, it, it, takes, it, it, it catches fire. And so uh, they, they, they become millionaires. And, but uh, the, most people in the white New York don't know that. And so they know about the presence of the game, but they speak about it derisively, and they call it nigger pennies. Right? <laughs> but they don't realize that uh, black people are making money. Right? And so they come to realize it at the end of Prohibition. And, uh, and the white gangsters, the Jewish and Italian white gangsters, take over policy because they, they realize that there's money being made and not just pennies. Um, and, they, and, so, and, they, and they subordinate um, a, a Puerto Ricans and African Americans and African Caribbeans in particular who the leaders of the game, African Caribbeans, African Caribbeans to uh, um, uh, really pronounced uh, 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 policing, right? And so the, uh, uh, policy, one of the reasons why policy is destroyed is because white gangsters try to take it over. The other reason why it's destroyed is because they set the police on them <laughs> because they have the police in their pocket, right? And um, uh, uh, that, that you, you look at the arrest rates for uh, all offenses, arrests were going down throughout the 1930s, all offenses, except for policy. And most people who were being arrested were African Americans, African Caribbeans, and Puerto Ricans, and other uh, uh, Spanish speaking African Caribbeans. Um, and so, um, so this leads to the shared spaces of criminalization. Um, uh, uh, um, you know, phenomenon is the, you know, you see in, in, in New York City, it's a long standing. Uh, a historical relationship rivalry uh, between the NYPD and the African Afri diaspora communities in New York City, um, which takes the form of kind of a marked policing um, and criminalization, a marked policing, a marked vigilance, which uh, uh, which creates disproportions in the arrest rates and conviction rates across the board since the 18 since the 1820s, uh, since the establishment of, of penitentiaries in, in, in the northern in northern cities. This is this is the phenomenon. So Puerto Ricans fall right into it, and so this is a, right at the height of their rise in 1929. You have various articles that are dedicated to to the uh, uh, heavy handed police. This is one of them. Atropellos policiacos en el barrio y para de Harlem. And so this is just a kind of representative of the phenomenon of the over policing. This is a, a page from the um, the, sort, the source that I use where, where I identify people who are arrested. And the whole page is uh, uh, black people. The <laughs> people classified as black. And they were all arrested for uh, the same offense. And so this was kind of a tactic by the police. They do drag nets and they sweep and arrest all, like a group of people at the same time for specifically for this a very vague offense for disorderly conduct. And if you looked at all and you, you, you did, if you look at all of the uh, um, if you look at the, the, the rest of the figures, the offenses, for the whole city, disorderly conduct is the principal uh, uh, offense which people are being arrested. But um, on the occasion of African Americans and Puerto Ricans and other African Caribbeans, it, it, it takes on uh, added significance, right? And when I was reading the, these pages, I came over page after page after page of these kind of homogenous uh, uh, arrest incidents. There were all these people that were arrested in black on this one, like 20, 30 people at a time. So, Represent, representative of this uh, this uh, criminalization, and so um, the other criminalization is kind of alluded to already. The other shared space of criminalization alluded to the fact that, uh, uh, the, and I, I mentioned this before, that white gangsters uh, uh, kind of had a, a comfortable relationship with machine politicians. This is, uh, in my estimation, this is the way I'm reading it. This is, I think this, I think I do this. I don't know if anybody else does this, but I think I do this. Uh, you know, I, I kind of talk about the long historical uh, manifestation of the Jacksonian age relationship. Uh, that uh, Alexander Saxton points to when he talks about the figures in, 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 in the principal figures in, in, in white Republican whiteness, in the Republican whiteness. And so one of the principal figures he points to is the urban, poli uh, uh, urban political machine, uh, uh, the, the, the urban political machine boss, right? And so the urban, so when you read, uh, the, the, oh God, Alexander Saxton's text, uh, help me, I'm, I'm forgetting, the, the invention of the white race? No, the invention of the white race, the rise of the white Republic, the rise of the white Republic, right? When you read that text, uh, when he's he's kind of dealing with these pre anti antebellum figures that are representative of this phenomenon, right, of the, of, of whiteness and, and, and of, of the consolidation of the white republic, these urban machine politicos are representative of that. And so, what happens is that in every, um, it almost uh, consistently from the, 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 the that from the Jacksonian age on to the 1920s, you have the manifestation of this relationship between. Uh, uh, criminals and urban machine, machine politicians, invariably between uh, white 
white youth gangs, uh, immigrant white youth gangs, and um, and urban machine pol uh, politicos. And, and, and the manifestation of that are these neighborhoods that are criminalized, the red light districts. And um, Richard R. Wright, a black sociologist, says at the turn of the century that the red light districts are all concentrated in black neighborhoods. But at that time, they were also concentrated in, in European white, in, in immigrant white neighborhoods, particularly um, uh, uh, Jewish neighborhoods. And the Jew towns were also synonymous with prostitution during that time. And what happens is that, according to Kevin J. Mumford, there's a shift um, after the uh, after the uh, 1920s, a shift in part due to the New Deal, uh, where the uh, there's a campaign, a progressive movement campaign, to uh, get rid of the red light districts. But they get rid of the rest light districts, all the old ones that are both black, uh, immigrant white and black, and then the new ones that arise are the new immigrant, the new uh, red light districts are a, a exclusively ensconced in black neighborhoods. And this is Harlem during the 1920s during Prohibition. You know, a, a prohibition, the, the speakeasies, the illegal alcohol trade was dominated by Jews and Italians, and the principal place to experience uh, 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 liquor and jazz was on these streets in Harlem. Um, and so, um, uh, during, during prohibition, and, and so this is representative of this new phase of the exclusive kind of ensconcement of criminalized activities uh, in, uh, in black neighborhoods. And so Puerto Ricans arrived precisely to that neighborhood again <laughs> during this time. Right, um, uh, and so uh, a representative of, of the impact of that is this uh, graphic. This is a study that was done on the relationship between study and crime, study uh, slum and crimes, slums and crimes. Uh, 1934 was commissioned for a few years earlier than that. Here you have uh, Harlem North 125th Street. This area was supposedly the principal area of uh, uh, with the highest rate arrest rates and conviction rates in the city. The third most was just south, where Puerto Ricans were and African Americans were, right here. I think we just saw earlier. There, right? North of Central Park. Um, and so, and, and, and this was also manifested in downtown Brooklyn. Remember, these are these spaces where Puerto Ricans concentrated in downtown Brooklyn during the same time, 1925 circa. This is the, uh, heart, the study, again, uh, done by uh, Irving Halpern. Look at the concentrations, the dense pockets of arrests, precisely in the same spots with Puerto Ricans and African Americans in downtown Brooklyn. That's it. That's the overview for the. Did I do 20 minutes? Did I do it? Did I yeah. do 20 minutes? Yeah. Yes. Woo! All right. Okay. Uh, are you guys uh, are you guys going to tolerate me reading something now for 20 minutes? Is it okay? Yeah. All right. <coughs> I, I, my seat my got cold. Okay. Give me a second. Let me set this up. Okay, all right. Okay, I'm, I'm going to read uh, an abbreviated <coughs> excerpt from, um, from my first chapter. It, the chapter is titled The Contingent Color and Racial Classification of Puerto Ricans Counting Black and White in the Brooklyn Colonia to kind of deepen more this idea of dissonance, right? This dissonance and representation, right? And what's it have to do with the shared Aphrodite for spaces of, uh, of Puerto Ricans and uh, other? Um, during the years between the two world wars, Puerto Ricans settled in a stretch of Brooklyn that some of the number coined the beachhead. Where they resided within this area, including which streets, blocks, or buildings, what jobs were available to them, and even their likelihood to be subject to arrest, all seemed to be bound by a common factor, their color and or race. This assessment is derived principally from a review of the enumeration sheets, enumeration sheets of the New York State Census of 1925 and the ledgers or docket books of the First District Magistrate Court of Brooklyn for 1925 and 1928. These sources contain an inventory of details on those Puerto Ricans residing in that region of New York City. While some details are particular to each source, such as occupation in the census and cause of arrest in the docket books, Others are common to both. The color and the race of these Puerto Ricans was an object of both sources. It fell within that class of minutia, supposedly ascertainable from a mere glance at the superficie of the persons being recorded on these sheets. The enumerators and desk clerks mining these ostensibly observable characteristics recall Foucault's assessment of the linear cat cataloging of natural history. This technique of knowledge production which Foucault cites for heralding in a natural, natural, scientific way of speaking, relied in part on the, quote, surfaces rendered visible, end quote, of its objects 
to rename and reorder them. But in the United States, it seems, neither the, quote, surfaces visible, end quote, of those classified, nor the actual categories of color and or race used to name them were given to such an orderly undertaking. The almost century-long wrangling over the legal definition of white persons, a criterion for US citizenship since the close of the 18th century, is evidence of this. Ian Henry Lopez documents how during that period, US courts, including the Supreme Court in two cases in the 1920s, 1920s, that's gotta be wrong. I think that's the 1880s, I'm sorry. That's, I don't know how that got in there, sorry. But vacillated between popular and scientific definitions of color and or race in its rulings on the claims to whiteness by persons suing for naturalization. The enumeration of mulattoes in the federal census taken in the four decades after the Civil War further demonstrates how disordered the whole endeavor of color and racial classification could be. The numbers of mulattoes count counted and the proportion of the black population at large in the United States rose and fell precipitously throughout that period. A surprisingly frank, frank discussion in the 1900 and 1910 censuses rather convincingly, convincingly attributes these peaks and troves not to demographic factors, but to shifts in the mode of, of the mode of classification of mulattoes. Puerto Ricans were referred to in these pages for comparative purposes, specifically in regards to the estimated share of mulattoes of the black and non-white population of the island archipelago enumerated in the 1899 census. It is telling that they were mentioned in relation to the problems associated with color and racial classification. The color and racial classification of those Puerto Ricans who lived in the beachhead during their tour years, it seems, was equally unstable. The proportions and numbers of those described as black, non-white, or white in the 1925 state census, on the one hand, and on the docket books for that same year, on the other, do not square with each other. This is the case when it comes to Puerto Rican black and non-white men. The enumerators of the 1925 New York State Census classified the majority of Puerto Ricans they encountered throughout the region as white. In May and June of 1925, out of the, the 84,000 persons residing in this area of Brooklyn who were counted by the state census, 1,700 or so, were either born in Puerto Rico or at least had one Puerto Rican born parent. Of these, 87% were recorded as white and the remaining 13% as black or some of the non-white category. This was consistent with the returns from the federal census at the time for Puerto Ricans in New York at large and for those in the island archipelago as well. I mentioned this before. Successive federal census recorded a gradual whitening or an increase of the share of whites over blacks and non-whites. I'm, I'm kind of going over the details here. Um, and I, I mentioned this seemed to fit within a much older trend for Puerto Ricans in the island archipelago. Again, the growing proportion of whites over blacks, right? While most of those Puerto Ricans residing throughout the beachhead were classified as white, as white in the state census, count of May and June of 1925, the opposite was the case for those subject to arrest throughout that year. The desk clerks who filled out the ledgers of the local magistrate court described most of those Puerto Ricans arrested as black. Persons apprehended by the police throughout the beachhead during the interval years were arraigned at the first district magistrate court of Brooklyn. Their names recorded in lodges known as docket books. On the docket books of this court for the year 1925, eight out of every 10 of the arrestees who were Puerto Rican activity classified as black. This was an exact inversion of the color and racial proportions among Puerto Ricans recorded in the contemporary state and federal enumerations. Even when the proportions of black and white classified Puerto Ricans arrested level at about 50% each in 1928, this was a departure from the absolute white majority described in the federal and state census of the years 1920, 1925, and 1930 that most of the Puerto Ricans who were arrested were classified as black in the docket books, while most of those residing throughout the beachhead were described as white, might not be consistent. Given the reality of race and of color in the criminal justice system of, in the city at the time, it was an anything problem. Black people in New York City during, before, and after the interwar years were disproportionately more subject to police arrest, court prosecution, and jail than whites. I go into this in another section. The problem resides not in the overwhelming prevalence of blacks among those Puerto Ricans who were arrested but in their numbers and where they lived throughout this part of Brooklyn. Overall, there are just too many Puerto Rican blacks appearing in the docket books. So many that they either reach unbelievable proportions of the numbers of Puerto Ricans throughout the beachhead classified as black and or non-white, or exceed these altogether. 
In the docket books of the First District Magistrate Court of Brooklyn for 1925, there were 140 entries documenting, documenting arrests of Puerto Ricans. 94 of these arrests were of those residing in that area identified as the beachhead. 75 of these persons were classified as black. In that same year, the state census counted a total of 220 black or non-white Puerto Ricans in the beachhead. If both of these figures are accurate, this would have meant that just over a third of all black or non-white Puerto Ricans residing throughout this region of Brooklyn were arrested at some point in 1925. This is an astoundingly high proportion, close to six times that for all Puerto Ricans in the beachhead. The 94 Puerto Ricans who were arrested in 1925 represented only 5% of the 1,700 or so counted by the state census, a percentage which mirrored the proportions of New York City arrested in that year and Brooklyn in 19, arrested in 1930. The proportion of black and non-white Puerto Ricans from the beachhead that could have been subject to arrest becomes even more pronounced when adjusting for age and gender. All but 75 Puerto Rican black arrestees appearing in the docket books from 1925 were men ranging from the ages of 18 to 48. In that same year, the state census identified 77 black and non-white Puerto Rican men of this age range throughout the beachhead. If these figures from both sources are correct, all of these Puerto Rican black and non-white men, save three, could have at one time or another been subject to arrest in 1925. By comparison, only 14% of all beachhead Puerto Rican men of the same age, irrespective of color classification, might have been arrested in 1925. This proportion was still quite high, especially when contrasted with the arrest rate for their fellow non-Puerto uh, Rican Brooklynites at large. Five years later, in 1930, only 3% of all Brooklyn men of a comparable age range were subject to arrest. The same scenario emerges when one considers the particular areas within the beachhead where those arrested Puerto Ricans lived. If the numbers of Puerto Rican black and non-white men reported above the census and the doctor's books even approximates their actual presence at the time, then in many of these places, the proportions of those arrested in 1925 was not just high, but astronomical. 15 of the Puerto Rican blacks arrested, according to the doctor books, resided in the heart of an area referred to by the contemporaries as Borough Hall. While the state census counted 24 men of the same age of color living there. These figures are accurate. 63% of all the Puerto Rican black men and non-white men of that area could have been arrested at some point in 1925. But in other places, the proportions are just implausible. The 11 Puerto Rican black men arrested hanging from the southern part of the area referred to as the Columbia Street referred to as Columbia South, not only exceeded, but also doubled the sixth of comparable age the state census counted there. In turn, the 35 arrested from the area known to migrants as La Avenida was more than four times the number of those Puerto Rican, and black, Puerto Rican black or non-white men of comparable age the state census found there. Those arrested from La Avenida also doubled the total number of black and non-white Puerto Ricans, irrespective of age and gender, that the state census counted there. Nine of the arrested returned addresses in that part of the beachhead bordering the Navy Yard. All of them classified as black. This, was, this could have comprised nearly a third of all the Puerto Ricans found there by the state census were it not for one complication. The state census classified all, all of these people as white. The divergences in the number of Puerto Rican blacks and non-white men not only rule out a prima facie reading of these sources, but they expose the pretense, the pretense of their use for any precise rendering of the color and racial proportions prevailing among those Boricuas residing in the beachhead during this year. I'm going to skip another section. You guys are following me? Yes. Okay, I hope so. I'm going to do it, you know. Um, if demographic, dem how much time do I have for, for discussion, right? I, yeah. I want to bet by 12.30, that, that would be good, right? Yeah. Okay, let's see. I'm going to get there. Let's see. We have two, one. We have the room. Yeah, but I want to open up the discussion. Yeah. If, demogra if demographics, okay, I, I go into a section on demographics, right? Like, um, um, particularly um, uh, migratory waves to try to explain uh, the disproportions, and I discount that. I'm not going to, so I'm going over that discussion. So, there's the next chapter, the next paragraph. If demographic shifts do not seem to account for the divergent numbers of Puerto Rican black men in the beachhead counted by these sources, then maybe the manner in which the state census and the docket books classify the color and the race of their subjects can. This is, the, this is the federal census, not the state census. I don't have an image of the state census. I apologize for that. Why do I actually? Well, no, I put that there. I'm sorry. I thought I didn't have one. This is, the state census was more, pretty much the same format, right? <clears throat> New York State hired its enumerators for the 1925 census to canvass the jurisdictions described as assembly and election districts. <clears throat> they would record information on all persons residing within the boundaries of those districts under their charge. The instructions provided to these enumerators directed them to conduct a 13th question interview. 
They hand wrote the answers upon sheets called schedules, each of which was divided into 13 columns. One column they filled out was called an erase. The instructions suggest several possible ent entries that could be written under this heading. W for white, B for black, Negro or, ne Negro or Negro descent, CH for Chinese, J for Japanese, IN for Indian. Anticipating that this list hardly covered the diversity of persons awaiting the enumerators, the, the instructors ended with, an open -ended, with the open-ended phrase, or the, case, or the case may be. Along with individual persons, the other principal object census enumerators were directed to record was the household. Each residence would be represented as a household on the enumeration schedule, whether it was occupied by a lone person or a group of related or unrelated persons. Whenever possible, the enumerators would directly, directly question the head of each household or someone else qualified to provide the relevant details regarding all of its members. If no one lived at the unit, if no one who lived at the unit was available, a relative, a neighbor, or someone in charge of the property was sought. If the enumerators judged the responses provided by these persons as misrepresentations or merely incorrect, they would enter their own assessments. Along with the willingness, with their willingness to either accept or trump these answers, what the enumerators wrote was also determined by how each of these read these surfaces rendered visible of the persons residing in the beachhead. In other words, the color and racial classification of the persons residing in the beachhead was subject to the varying interpretations of these enumerators. That some of them introduced categories not appearing in the instructions suggests this. So I go into uh, you know, vir virtually all the enumerators of the census, uh, uh, there were 25 of them, 25 people canvassed the, the beachhead. And of those 25, uh, uh, just about all of them, with the exception of one, used these categories of black and white. They didn't, they didn't, uh, they didn't diverge from using those categories, right? I talk about, though, um, how there was a, a few that did, right? Uh, just a few, right? And I go into how there was an instance where uh, a whole gang of Puerto Ricans were classified as a gang. A whole group of Puerto Ricans were classified as Filipino. Right, mm -hmm. uh, Joaquin Colón mentions. He says uh, we were we were called all kinds of things: black, white, Spanish, Filipino. Interesting. And uh, anyways, well, I'm 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 uh, passing that discussion. Um, at best, the enumerators of the next 25 New York State Census use these other categories sparingly, but that they use them at all is still worth mentioning. In the ledgers which recorded the arrest of Puerto Ricans from the beach during that same year, there was no such variance in their color racial classification in the magistrate court documents, right? No variation. On the ledgers of the first district magistrate court of Brooklyn, otherwise known as the docket books, I keep saying repeating this, with scant ex exceptions, there are only three color and racial categories that are apparent. B, W, C, H, presumably black, white, and Chinese. All of the Puerto Ricans arrested during those two, those two years and listed in these ledgers are classified either as black or white. The desk clerks who wrote these entries introduced, introduced no other categories, unlike the census, where there were people who kind of explored different categories, right? Exceptionally, it still happened. It, didn't ha it actually did not happen in the, on the occasion of people being arrested. And apparently, they were much less given to interpretation in this respect than were the enumerators of the state census. The radically different encounter of the desk clerks with the persons they classified might have something to do with this. Enumerators of the census were instructed to be courteous, the census. Prompt and businesslike in their household visits, the instructions, etc. They were to accept the responses of those interviewed unless incorrect, evasive, or just obviously forced. false. Here, those beachhead Puerto Ricans interviewed might have had some room to influence how the enumerators classified them, as well as the other members of their household. Whether the responses of those interviewed remained on the pages of the state manuscript census depended on the deference, indifference, or lack thereof of the enumerators who recorded them. This exchange could have been in part responsible for the occasional use by selected enumerators of different color categories. In all likelihood, there was no such even limited input available to those who were arrested and brought to the first district, first district court when they were uh, uh, Brooklyn when they were arrested. All that is known about the process is that they were carted off to the courts, carted off to the courts for arraignment right after arrest, or soon after arrest. They probably panned for a couple of days and when they for a couple of days and still happens. You get, you get locked up on a Friday, you don't see the court. You're not arraigned until Monday, you spend the whole weekend in jail. Um, and that they, there they encountered the desk clerks at the courts who were describing on the docket books. There was, it seems, little room for deference here. The Puerto Ricans arrested were probably paraded in front of the desk clerks by the arresting officer, the only of the third parties here. 
there were no other intermediaries. More than likely, the clerks were not even required to ask those arrested their color to race, as were the state census enumerators. They probably did little more than register their own perceptions of the color and a race of these surfaces rendered visible. So, while the diversity of color categories used to describe Puerto Ricans in the state census might have in part arisen from their input, right? Their black and or white classification in the docket books could be representative of, representative of their silence. So could the fact that, unlike the state census numerators, the desk clerks mostly opted to describe those beach and Puerto Ricans they encountered as black. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> <laughs> I'm, 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 I'm trying to do it in five minutes, and I'll give us 20 minutes, right? 25 minutes, right? Okay. okay. As already mentioned in 1925, the desk clerks classified eight out of every ten of those Puerto Ricans arrested as black. Again, so many Puerto Rican black men were counted in the docket books that they appeared in places where the only body quests found by the state census were white. Close to half of all those Puerto Rican blacks arrested in 1925, though, lived in La Avenida, an area where the state census identified quite a few black classified Puerto Ricans. Right? Well, relative to their numbers, right? They made up close to a third of all the Puerto Ricans residing through this, throughout this area and outnumbered their white classified compas in those clusters where Puerto, Rico, where Puerto Ricans were more densely concentrated. More importantly, La Avenida was the only one of those residential clusters of Puerto Ricans making up the beachhead where most of their neighbors were classified as black. We spoke about this already. There it is again. This was the case within that corner of La Avenida where Puerto Ricans were most densely concentrated. On the city blocks within this area, this enumeration is divided into city blocks very, very exactly, right? On the city blocks within this area where the New York State Census of 1925 found Puerto Ricans, pers persons classified as black made up a majority of the residents. Most were African, African U.S. New Yorkers, African Americans, while the rest hailed from different parts of the non-Hispanic Caribbean. I, I skipped a little bit. Of all those clusters of Puerto Ricans that taken together probably constituted the beachhead, La Avenida was by far the most African diaspora. Mm -hmm. That more than a third of all Puerto Ricans arrested from throughout the beachhead hailed from La Avenida suggests that the desk clerks did not just imagine their blackness. Many of them were in all likelihood obviously of African descent. Mm -hmm. Still, the state census did not find enough black classified Puerto Ricans in that part of the beachhead to account for all those arrested and listen to the docket books. I keep going back to the same table, just so you have a point of reference, right? Um, as already mentioned, the amount of Puerto Rican black men arrested from La Avenida in 1925 doubled that of all the Puerto Rican blacks and non-whites, irrespective of gender and or age, which the state census counted there that same year, La Avenida. Not even in the other areas of the beachhead where the state census, they, the state census counted many more black and non-white Puerto Ricans could the number of Puerto Rican and black men of arrest age realistically account for those arrested from La Avenida. So yeah, you have, uh, an abundance of black Puerto Ricans in other areas, but even if you take them into consideration, realistically, the numbers, your raw numbers were, again, 95, 95% of all Puerto Ricans, of black classified Puerto Ricans that age range were arrested. Right? So it's, it's still, it's, even with the presence of other black classified Puerto Ricans in the state census, it still doesn't realistically count, realistically count for the phenomenon. Why were so many Puerto Rican black men arrested from Avenida? So that they not only exceeded the number of the state census had found there, but constituted such an exorbitant proportion, exorbitant proportion of those which the census identified throughout the rest of the beach. Mm -hmm. The state census of 1925 was enumerated during, well, during the month of June. It was then that the enumerators canvassed La Avenida and the rest of the beach, moving throughout the election districts which were their charge. They went from one city block to another, listing all of the residents and buildings of each on separate census sheets. Although the enumerators recorded close to 2,000 Puerto Ricans residing throughout the area, they seem to have missed most of those who were arrest, arrested. Most of the arrested during 1925 had addresses on city blocks where the enumerators of the state census failed to find any Puerto Rican men who fell within the age range of those arrested. In fact, most of the arrested resided on blocks where the state census found no Puerto Ricans at all. Now the table there. Uh, this is explained in different ways. Uh, Vega, uh, uh, Vega contemporary says that Puerto Ricans were practitioners of weird, of weird nomad, nomadism. That had to do with uh, uh, suffering, uh, being subject to bad housing, 
So at the beginning, at the beginning of every month, you, the, the way New York City law functions at that time, you could decide your contract at the end of the month, you could pick up and go. And there were caravans every month of people changing apartments. This is a phenomenon, according to Shell Greenberg, among black Harlemites. Uh, uh, and it was a phenomenon, according to Vega, it was a phenomenon in Harlem. According to Colón, it was a phenomenon in Beach. This might have something to do with the uh, missing people on the blocks, right? But Joaquin Colón noted quite a bit of movement within the Brooklyn Beach as well. Uh, much of it was an eastward, eastward bound quest from the waterfront area of Columbia Street for the better housing and jobs located in Borough Hall. That most were classified as black, could, I'm, I'm skipping, could have brought them this far east uh, to La Avenida in, in their search for apartments and rooms to let. Many of the Puerto Rican men who were obviously of African descent were more likely to be limited in their option to neighborhoods where other blacks resided, hence La Avenida, right? Some of them probably chose to live in this most African park site. This is simply one of them, right? Other people are African descent. But whatever the reasons for the settlement of the majority of those arrested Puerto Ricans in La Avenida and the Navy Yard, you know, uh, uh, Jason area, it is curious that almost without exception, they were missed by the state census as well. Even these people were missed. Virtually all of the arrested who reported living in this part of the beach had saved two, returned addresses on city blocks where the 1925 state census found not a single Puerto Rican. So the phenomenon persists. Right? And so I, I, I'm, I'm really skipping here because I really want to get to the point. Um, I'm going to read a transitional sentence that might seem out of context, but it's going to be the next the point, the, 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 the section I want to get to, right? So I ask the question. Um, perhaps many of those Puerto Rican men arrested who had been classified as black on the pages of the court dockets were classified as white in state census. There might not have been enough Puerto Rican black men of arrest stage on these city blocks to account for those arrested, but there were more than enough white ones. That Puerto Ricans of African descent living in this part of Brooklyn during the interwar years could have been classified as white is entirely plausible. It happened to two of their number, whose lives are among the most well documented. So here's Joaquin Colón, obviously black. Jesu Colón, obviously black. Both appears as There it is. Both appears white on the state census. <coughs> These are the most representative yeah. Yeah. Puerto Ricans aside from South Africa, <laughs> of African descent, right? <clears throat> and here we are. Um, I want to talk about, about Jesu Colón and, and, and uh, their importance and the way they embody uh, an ethic, of, uh, a particular version of an ethic of African diaspora struggle, right? Understood in the context of the Puerto Rican community, right? Mm -hmm. And so, um, a, a, so I asked the question, how is it that they, how, how can they, how is it that they, every sign in the heart of each other, along with their wives, could be classified as white, right, in the film since 1930. This is the first time they were described this way is since their appearances in the sense of the previous two decades. So I, I, I go into how, uh, again, I'm trying to summarize. They were classified as uh, mulatto in 1920 in the state census, when they lived with their families. Families, uh, they, 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 when they, when, when, before they were married, they lived with their, their, their parents and their siblings. And so in 1920 in Brooklyn, they were all classified as a lot of their parents and siblings. In 1910 in Calle, when they were still living with their family before they migrated, Calle in Puerto Rico, before they migrated, um, they were also classified as a lot. Mm -hmm. right? So here in 1930, they were classified as white. So what's going on? Mm -hmm. right? um, I, I, I go into a discussion um, about the, the, the place of mulatto classification in the census. Um, a, a, in, in, on the occasion of some of the censuses, like for the 1930 census, where the Colombos appear as Bonato, the instructions, the, the instructions ex specifically indicated that the Bonato category should not be used. Right? So that might explain part of why they were no longer classified as Bonato, but why not classified as black, why they not classified as white. Right? So I think I'm, I'm trying to get to the summary discussion. I really want to wrap this up. I really want to wrap this up because I, I, I really want to get to this discussion here. Um, just bear with me. Bear with me. Okay. Yeah. So. So again, yet it addressed. It, it leaves addressed unaddressed to change. Right? How could the color racial class description of these persons shift from one source to the next? The term Negro was still available in the numerators to describe all persons of Negro blood, no matter how small the percentage. That both of the Colombian brothers were obviously of African descent. Should have been apparent to anyone who saw them, saw them. But in order for the clones to appear in that, or in any other census, they didn't have to be seen at all. Neither for that matter did the overwhelming majority of the Puerto Ricans reside at the beach. So 
and, and you know what's happening here? Um, the census enumerations, all of them were by proxy, okay. right? So you see one person, that person tells you what everybody else looks like, or on the basis of that person, you judge what everybody else looks like, and you got it. So uh, uh, you only see a fifth of the population. A fifth. A decimates the fifth. 1910, 1900 census, uh, federal census, or 19. It, it has this whole section on, on race classification, the introduction of the census. And it talks about the problem of the classification of, of, of black people. And it talks about the problem of a, a, this problem of an under-enumeration that's chronic with the form of enumeration that's by proxy. So the estimations that people are being missed, a large, people in Africa, a large cross section in the African American community, has been missed in the previous five census, four census prior to 1900. This is what the, what the federal census is saying. And so uh, state census is, is, is functioning by proxy. So you can imagine how, uh, you know, you, if you look here, the, the, the Globe Brothers were, were, they worked in the post office, they got good jobs. Yeah, most of so, um, uh, they will probably work, and uh, the numerators encounter their white-looking, white lives, <laughs> right? Um, so you can imagine how that that the 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 uh, the, <laughs> the, uh, the 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 modus operandi of the census gave gave, gave uh, created this, right? And so. That the Cologne brothers could have been classified as white because nobody saw them, okay, then I can see the part of it, right? It, 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 it wasn't just who could you, you couldn't see, it was who you didn't see, it was who you did see. So if you didn't see the Cologne brothers, you saw their wives, that was kind of right. Partial, right? And I've talked about how this is also a subject in the, uh, the federal uh, census instructions. They, the, the introduction of the federal census in 1910 talks about this problem, right? With, with, with this kind of color classification. And so, and, so the idea is that the, the, because the uh, nature of the classification is by households, so then a, a, the presence of a person of obvious African descent or not would homogeneously classify the family, the entire family, mm -hmm. <laughs> right? And so this is uh, the other contributing factor, and this again, it's discussed in the 1900, 1910. So now I'm wrapping up. I'm gonna wrap up now, this is it. Uh, but explaining precisely how the Cologne brothers came to be classified as white is not the point here. How the process of census enumeration could have made their whitening possible and that of other Puerto Ricans in the beach had liked them is. The section on Negroes in 1900 federal census notes that all enumerations since 1950 had probably undercounted people in African descent in the United States. That the section details the pitfalls of enumerating by proxy and observation implies that implies these at least contributed to such an outcome. These conclusions, if correct, might help explain why it appears as if all of the black and non-white Puerto Rican men counted by the state census could have been arrested in that same year. Much in appearance, much like their federal counterparts, the enumerators of the state census relied on proxy, right? Maybe they also fell short, fell short and they counted those obviously African descended Puerto Ricans residing in the beach end. On these grounds, we might be able to conclude that the shortage of Puerto Rican black men of arrest states in the state census, or alternatively their surplus in the docket books, was in part a product of the different circumstances shaping their color and racial classification in each of these sources. There were no third parties involved in the color and racial classification of those Puerto Ricans who were arrested. Neither were the spouses or relatives of those arrested consulted using stand-ins when they were arrested, nor was the decades-old convention of protocol or reasonable deference to the interview of federal enumeration, which is at least in writing instructions to state enumerators, present in the color racial classification of those arrested. Those Puerto Rican men arrested in Boston and Dex Clutch were probably not asked about their color and race, and thus, unlike their counterparts in the state census, had no say in the matter. So, the circumstances that could have contributed to the writing of the Cologne brothers in the federal census might have been the same for considerable portion, proportions of those Puerto Rican black men mm -hmm. who were arrested on city blocks with the state census found to to no black Boricuas. Boricuas is another term for Puerto Ricans. Much like the Cologne brothers, many of these men were probably of African descent. The disproportionate arrest and conviction rates of black people in New York City suggest that these Puerto Ricans were obviously black, those Puerto Ricans were obviously black, were probably more likely to suffer that experience. Further, many of them lived in La Avenida, the only area of the beachhead where most of those residing alongside of Puerto Ricans are classified as black instead of white. Mm -hmm. These same Puerto Rican men classified as black in the document books probably passed as white on the pages of the state census, much as the Cologne brothers had done in the 1930 federal census. This is why those in the, in, in the arrested in the, in the court dockets are completely missing from the state census. Mm -hmm. They were only missing because they were classified as white. That they did not pass as white in the courts is suggested. They probably did not pass as white on the streets of Interwar Brooklyn and New York City Island.
And we have 15 minutes for, for questions, debate, comments. Anybody want to start? Nadine? Since by then we would have been already citizens, right? Did you in your research come across how Puerto Rican enlisted men were qualified? No, I, I, I haven't looked at those sources. I have not been able to look at those sources. I, I'm sorry. <laughs> No, no, no. Sources pass and No, no, no. But I, I'm, I'm just sure. And, I mean, those are the kind of things I love to look at. Mm -hmm. um, when the clerks were writing down the doctor books, the two classifications, and they classified a lot of the Puerto, Puerto Ricans as black, do you think that was a subconscious thing, or they were conscious of giving it? Mm -hmm. Boy, that's, uh, I, I, have, I can't get into those guys' heads. I have no idea. I think what I'm suggesting here is that what Sadia Hartman says. Sadia Hartman and uh, uh, I think Clarence Williams to, to a lesser degree, um, but they talk about why segregation, right? right? And Anne Hale does, does this too. When he talks about the Supreme Court cases, how do how the Supreme Court judges determine the Supreme Court cases? Mm -hmm. They didn't determine it on the expert testimony of, of scientists about race. They defer to popular sentiment on race in the United uh -huh. States. To co co and this was consistent in all of their decisions. The state sense, the, the federal census of 1900, it decides if you have a problem classifying black people, defer to popular sentiments. <laughs> it doesn't say popular sentiments. De de defer to the community standards of race. And how, find out how those people are classified in the community. Right? So, you, so I think that generally what Sadio Harman says and, 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 and Anne says, that the, that the dominant discourse on race was, was deferred to, to the popular discourse on race. Mm -hmm. So I think that these cops were reflecting the popular discourse on race. And they were looking at people who to them were somatically perceptible as not white, probably black. Right. Right? Yeah, so I mean, this is great work. I, I, I really appreciate all this that you're doing. Yeah, it's all right. very good. <laughs> Thank um, you. I, and and I, 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 did, I did want to push you a little bit more to think about how, because uh, I, I, do, I do get the sense that the two sets of sources in the end, you decided one really got the race and one didn't. And I would want to push you back a little bit and think, Okay, good, I'm glad. No, 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 I'm saying back it's a two, two, two spaces of racialization. Yeah, okay, that's I, 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 right, exactly. Right, exactly. So it might be also that, because one of the one of the hypotheses is that, is that because of the way, and I think it's, it's very well sustained, that because of the way the census works, there's more opportunity either to be measuring race by proxy or to be deferring to, to but it's also the case that the stakes of counting somebody on the census is different, where the stakes of counting somebody in a criminal, in a criminal case. Right. And I wonder whether you know you, you could you could elaborate and maybe if you maybe you do in the in the longer text a little bit more on, on what the racializing moment of arrest is. That is to say you make a compelling case that people who are already previously identified as black right. are criminalized. But it also may be that people who are being criminalized are more likely to be classified as black. No that's that, 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 that's what I'm arguing. <laughs> yeah, right. That's what so I'm arguing. So the, 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 the <laughs> not, I mean so the, the alone sure. example is is a good one in some ways because you know, photographs and self-identification, we, we sort of know that they're black, but there may be a lot of people who photographs or self-identification wouldn't wouldn't be that compelling, who are nevertheless, when you're being, when you're male and on the street in these certain circumstances, you're black, and when you're female or in a workplace or someplace else, you're something else. And that would suggest that it's not just that there's one real sure. experience of racialization, but in fact, there's these kind of multiple racializing moments, and, and that the criminal one is one that's heavily skewed towards, towards black. Mm -hmm. Right? Sure. So that, that's basically, that's, that's precisely what I'm working. I mean, I'm talking about different, different sites of racialization. Uh, um, I mean, it, it, but the, the, states, the census is a very consistent, they're white majorities. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> that's a space of white, white majority racialization. Right, that, that allows the, the filtration of the prevailing discourse of race among Puerto Ricans to be registered. Yeah. Right? But it's also, interesting enough, a phenomenon that's, uh, that's chronic to the census and to the, that form of enumeration that creates problems of enumeration of people of African descent in the United States. Problems for people who, want, who don't want people to be counted as white. Not necessarily problems for the people who are choosing to be counted as white. Say it again. It's problems for the 1900 right. census. It's a problem for the people who are worried that too many people are being counted as mulatto. Exactly. Mind, right? Exactly. But, but exactly. it's not the same as a problem. Exactly. A universal problem. Sure. 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 Yeah. Precisely. That, and that's why that's 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 why the preoccupation, the the the, the introduction to the 1910 census, it's you've got to be, it's, it's kind of not extensive, but it's like two three pages, and it really gets into it. It really kind of ponders, you know, why the problems of of of, of black classification and Indian classification. Those are the principal. Right. Uh, 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 Categories, right? 
And so it, 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 it's kind of it's really wrestling with the problem in, in relationship to the to the to the nature of the enumeration. But it's wrestling with the problem precisely because it's an undercount, and we need to get the count right. right. It's, it's precisely what you're saying. You know, so. Um, so I, I just yeah. want to follow up. I was wondering whether it's possible with the data that you have to trace individuals who were both arrested and actually. I have a couple of those. Census. I have a couple of those, but, but I, you know, I didn't anticipate this would be a problem. So when I originally canvassed, I didn't get names. I only got names exceptionally. So now I understand that this stuff is available. I, I can see. actually do the cross referencing now. But that's you know we're talking about ten years after. So, so, so you originally you originally tabulated without actually capturing names exactly. I just I just I because there's too much. Right. I mean you know. And this is way back in the day, you know, before we were walking around with this, you know, selfie technology. Right. right? You know? <laughs> so, because that, that would be an interesting way of, of thinking about 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 the multiple space of regionalization in, in, in sure. one person. It's very apparent to me that this this, this is happening uh, with Puerto Rican say. Yeah. I also um, thank you for the talk. Um, I is, that, is that okay? I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. Thanks. Keep me talking. Yeah, we'll talk more. Okay. <laughs> I, I was wondering if if you also had any type of data. In terms of what does gender do within the household? In terms of of how if, how and if gender informs racialization within the household. So what happens when when you know when women are interviewed versus men are interviewed? That's that's something I have no real good conceptual apparatus. I came late on the gender train. <laughs> I have to tell you, and I, I'm lamenting. Because I've, you know, I've recently, you know, come across some great stuff that really has me, you know, like, like, uh, in, oh my God, um, uh, in, oh my God, uh, I forgot her name, uh, Jesse. No, Jesse. I'm sorry. Yeah, no, no, her name. Her name. Uh, she writes about uh, race, race, and color, and gender policing, uh, and then she does it. Oh, I didn't feel it. I didn't feel it. Work. To me, it was just earth shattering. You know, in terms of considering how. This could be interesting because she's she's looking at households, race and her color, over, over shifts over time, and she's connecting it this to discourses, yeah. to many discourses of gender. I don't have that conceptual apparatus operating here. Um, it's something. I, it's something quite frankly I need to do. So I, I'm sorry. No, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. I have to say though that it, it does, on the face of it, seem consequential, at least you know, in terms of other things. Like because I, I do, uh, unfortunately, I, I um um. um most of my information is related to uh, men, right? right? And that's part of it because I'm establishing, trying to establish this nexus between color racial classification, criminalization, um, residence, and um, labor, occupation. And so when I was tabulating my stuff for occupation, I had this real serious problem with the uh, classification, occupational classification of, of, of Puerto Rican women, of women. Yeah. And so it had to do with it. So I, it completely threw off my attempt to integrate uh, uh, them into, into into the into my explanation on this relationship. So I, 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 I had to I had to jettison it because I couldn't really treat it. But my suspicion is that particularly that you know uh, uh, Puerto Rican women's work here was was garment was garment industry, um, and they were doing uh, work at home, and uh, that probably played a role. They were probably present when the races were happening because they're doing peace work, you know. And so so this is, I'm just thinking off the, off the cuff right about this. Yeah, and, and um, I also think that. Um, there might be something also going on in terms of um, masculinity and the policing of masculinity um, sure. in racialized bodies. Definitely, um, sure. So, I mean, it's not only women, but it's also sure. Um, sure. masculinity and gender. And As Kev, Kev, Kevin J. Mumford, there's sex, sex home, in, into sex homes. Inter yeah. You see, you've seen it? Yeah. Okay. He did that some of that. It, it, yeah, a lot, actually. Yeah. yeah. I, and so, at my last chapter, I did with some of that. Okay. Yeah. I also, I. Thank you so much. It was a really interesting talk, and I really enjoyed um, hearing kind of about the data. Going through those census records is really exhausting work. Yeah, so it was really interesting to see um, the history that you put together. I, I think it's interesting, Yvonne's question about gender kind of intersects with the image that you showed at the beginning. I write about the history of social welfare um, and Puerto Rican migration. I, it was interesting because you begin with which one is white? which is ah, colored, okay, right? Okay, okay. So that's in the, you're moving into the 30s there a little further. I think that was like a case from 34 or 35. You know the case? But I wonder, no, I just saw the, okay. that you had right, right, okay. noted it. But it's interesting to me because I wonder about the moment that you are looking at for the censuses for 25, 28, and 30. Right. I wonder about how much that changes 
with, within only a few years, right, with the, with the development, with changes that are happening within the New Deal state. Because right. in this moment, in the 20s, sure. it's a moment of, you know, a very important moment of race making and sure. understanding of Puerto Ricans that changes really quickly when there are kinds of programs or kinds of sure. access that people are trying to get sure. where race makes a big difference. So sure. once you get into that kind of moment where people's lives are being intervened upon about uh, by the state in different ways other than maybe sure. being picked up by the cops, right? right. There's right. also a moment of race making again um, sure. that's being informed by this earlier moment. But I wondered about that gender question about how many um, men were in New York in that moment versus very shortly afterwards and how that was shaping the racial project. I, I, you know, I, I, I just, uh, you know, part of part of the way I, I, I would kind of think about this is kind of like, you know, looking at echoes of the experience of, of other African diaspora New Yorkers. You know, so uh, uh, one prominent feature that Du Bois uh, establishes um, uh, with Philadelphia Negro is the gender balance, right? And how that was central to the gender, particular kind of gender and racialization of the U.S. black community. And so, uh, uh, on the face of it, the, the numbers for Puerto Ricans in the beach at this gender imbalance hasn't happened. But I understand that it, by the 60s, you have a similar gender imbalance happening among, among Puerto Ricans. Uh, that there's more women than men. Right? And so that uh, uh, gender imbalance is, becomes consequential of the imagining of Puerto Ricans in that period. Right? Um, um, because, and then it, uh, the overrepresentation of Puerto Rican women working. Right, and in this period, um, in post uh, post industrialization, when you have a lot of manufacturers are leaving the city in the 60s, I'm putting away kind of leaving this this, this alone for a minute. Um, in, in that phase, a, a Puerto Ricans men are being gendered as are being gendered, yeah, being gendered as um, uh, a, a, a either a delinquent or lazy, right? Yeah. And Puerto Rican women who are being are, are represented as and late the language, right? And who are in, actually in 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 the, in the public sphere. You know? And so, um, so that, but I, I, I don't see that uh, happening at this point. Um, uh, uh, this, uh, uh, there seems to be kind of, uh, um, even with people on relief and stuff like that. There's already an overrepresentation of people on relief, and in the imagining, imagining of Puerto Rican men, like uh, in terms of some of the stuff that I've read, um, it's in the dissertation about um, crime, right? Um, there's an imagining of 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 uh, an abundance of Puerto Rican men hanging out, hanging out on street corners. Mm -hmm. Right, and so the hang out street corners and who hit women? Right. right. This is kind of a recurring theme. Tony McKay talks about it. The people who are being interviewed, uh, Puerto Ricans being interviewed, talks about it. Shalom talks about it. It's a recurring theme. So I, I suspect that already in the, in, the, in the depression period, which is you know, just after my, my profile here in 1925, that, that this kind of, uh, this other moment uh, of gendering and racing that you're talking about is, 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 is something for me. Right, with the kind of the structural, the, 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 the structural disparities that you know, according to people like Herbert, Herbert Goodman, become established uh, um, in, in the depression period. And Shel Greenberg too. That, you know, that the, the, the depression is a moment where you have a new kind of form of structural inequality impacts African Americans. I think that's the case also with Puerto Ricans in their incipient moment, their arrival. Right? They become inserted into that logic. And definitely in the case of crime, I hope the section of crime deals with that. I think we have one final question. Thank, thank you so much for your, for your talk. Um, so I so I work on um, like race and Brazil and blackness, and so I'm familiar with like you know I, ideologies of like whitening in Latin America, and um, and maybe you know Puerto Rico is different. You would you'll you know you'll correct me or I'll, 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 I'll just not question for all. <laughs> okay. Um, not at all. I was just, I was interested in like in in black Puerto Ricans coming from Puerto Rico and basically becoming black. And is right. that is that through the same mechanism of like one person on the block sort of identifying everyone as black right. or because I was I was really because you know in I mean still, you know, in, in Brazil at least, you know, most people who would you know be who would look black should say they're white, you know, and so I could see that, that happening, you know, in the US and the census comes and you say, Oh no, of course I'm not black, you're like white. And so sure. I'm just I'm just wondering if you have any thoughts about how that like how that occurs. I mean that that's part of what drives the, the, the Discussion, you know, when I, when I refer to this, you know, talking about dissonance, right? Um, this here, they, they confused us for people to come. Um, to them, we believe, right? And so, see, so I, you know, I, I didn't really kind of deep, and I was so caught up with the rendering the specifics of what was happening in, with this nexus in, in New York that I didn't really get into a detailed discussion of discourses of race in Puerto Rico and how 
the, these people would realize themselves in another discourse, another matrix, right? We're coming to the states and now we now we count in another, a different matrix, racial matrix. And they were finding it hard to recognize themselves in that matrix, right? You know, um, they were kind of lost in that matrix. They were there, or they, maybe they were, they were there, they, they, they were spotty, you know, they were a blip on the screen. And so, um, definitely, um, uh, um, I, just, just to give a, a real serious anecdote about this phenomenon, the Colon brothers, um, I met their daughter. Uh, their daughter was still, still around. Virginia, uh, uh, she's in, in her 70s, she lives in Puerto Rico. It's the daughter of Joaquin Colon. Um, when I started talking to her about this, I went into the body, she said to me, well, my father wasn't black. <laughs> you know, and so this is a, a, a kind of, you know, interesting from him, you read Joaquin Colon, he's like, hey, you know, what did I, I he, everything, much of what he has to do, he's one of the few people that have a real acute criticism of racism among Puerto Ricans in the interval period. Mm -hmm. Much more pronounced than that, that's mm -hmm. You get to read it. So yeah, that, that phenomenon is definitely part of what's, what's informing and what, what I'm seeing here. Right? It's that disconnect. Mm -hmm. So this has been fantastic, very rich. So join me in thanking Dr. Peter Eilerson. to mention that Peter just won the best dissertation award from the Puerto Rican Studies Association and he will be receiving the award at Denver um, on Friday at the biannual conference. Oh,